George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. A mother and daughter are murdered in the Holy Family Church in Gaza. Let me repeat that. A mother and her daughter are murdered by a sniper inside the Holy Family Church in Gaza. And they say this is a fight against Hamas, against the Islamist fanatics. Any politicians with Jesus on their sleeve had anything to say about that? Any journalists, anything to say about the 90th, 90, 90th journalist murdered in Gaza in 70 days? I thought not. Piers Morgan unmasked in the High Court as a liar and a venal cheat. Is it time to sack him from the airwaves? We're asking that in our potentially record breaking poll this very evening. There's much, much more and two of the best guests around all coming up here on the mother of all talk shows. Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway, the mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. He's a big man sitting behind Rupert Murdoch's billions in the misnamed talk TV that hardly anybody watches. But Piers Morgan was unmasked in the High Court this week in the case over Prince Harry's phone being hacked. Let me tell you about Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan was hacking my telephone whilst pretending to be a friend of mine. That's the kind of man he is. Unmasked by the judge, by the court, as a liar, as a venal phone hacker. A man hacking the phones of people in order to get cheap clicks. The same reason why he's had a parade of hapless scapegoats on his show over the last 70 days so that he could bait them, so that he could goad them, so that he could attempt to crucify them as supporters of Hamas. Well, he's not a supporter of Hamas. He's not a supporter of anybody at all, except Piers Morgan. Everything he does is for him. Nothing that he does or says is for you, for the education of the audience, for the elucidation and, and, and uh, spotlighting of important news and what it means. Piers Morgan is a grubby, greedy hack who's had nothing to say, like the rest of the hacks about the 90, 90 journalists murdered in a tiny piece of land, 25 miles long, five miles wide, over 70 days, more journalists than have been murdered in the Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War put together in 90 days in a tiny piece of land. Have you heard, Morgan? or any other journalist refer to it. Only Alex Crawford of Sky News is the only person that I have seen highlighting the systematic murder of journalists. Why are they murdering these journalists? They're murdering them because these journalists and their cameras and their words are bringing home to the public all around the world the sheer horror the sheer genocide being practiced against 2.3 million people trapped in that tiny piece of land with nowhere to run, with nowhere to hide. If it were not for these journalists, if it were not for social media, we would not know any of the mass murder 
that has been going on. So they are systematically eliminating them. And when they can't murder them, they murder their families. And when they can, they murder them and their families all together. It is sheer horror. And you wouldn't know anything about it if it were not for these slain journalists. Why did they murder a woman and her daughter in the Holy Family Church, Roman Catholic Church in Gaza today? For the same reason. They don't fit the narrative. After all, if all of Gaza is Hamas, and if Hamas is ISIS, how could there be a Roman Catholic Church in Gaza? How could there be some of the oldest Christian churches anywhere in the world in Gaza? How could they still be open? How could people still be praying? How could people be taking communion? How could people be confessing in these Roman Catholic churches? So out with them, kill them, burn them, bomb them, and they have killed, burned, and bombed one church after another in Gaza. Why do I dwell on it? I dwell on it because this Christmas time, hundreds of millions of Christians will be revering the birth of the baby, Jesus Christ, where? In Palestine, in Bethlehem. Have you seen Bethlehem? Do you know that Bethlehem is a town under siege, blocked off by roadblocks, surrounded by Israeli soldiers, regularly raided, people regularly mobbed up there. Don't you care about that? It's all this Jesus stuff, all this Christmas stuff for you, purely performative, or does it matter to you? that in the Holy Land, Satan is at work. Satanic forces are murdering women and children and old men and journalists, bombing churches, attacking hospitals. In the last 24 hours, a mass grave outside the Kamal Adwan Hospital in Gaza, already wrecked, already ruined, has been found. What happened there? A lot of refugees, 30, were sleeping in tents and Israel ran them over with a bulldozer, just like they did to Rachel Corey, the American eyewitness to their depravity, murdered in exactly the same way. Are there any doctors out there? Is there any medical association out there? Any professional guilds of medics, doctors, nurses in the Western world? Don't you care about people being murdered in hospitals? It seems you care as little as the Christian hierarchy and the oh-so-achingly Christian politicians and the oh-so-much-in-favor-of-freedom-of-the-press journalists who don't have a word to say, never mind a finger to lift, as their colleagues, professional colleagues, are murdered on an industrial scale. Nobody in power anywhere cares until you force them to care. Why did Bonkers, Baerbock, and Craven, Cowardly Cameron demand a ceasefire today when they've been voting against one in every forum in which it has arisen. Why did they call for a ceasefire today? Well, partly to protect themselves from legal actions already underway about their complicity in this genocide, in this mass murder, but partly also because they know that while no politician gives a toss, while no journalist or broadcaster gives a toss, while no medical guild or association gives a toss, the mass of the public care about what they are increasingly seeing on their screens, on their telephones, but seldom on their televisions themselves. They know that politicians, 
backing this carnage, backing this extermination campaign will never be forgiven by sections of their own electorate, people that used to vote for them. Joe Biden, for example, used to get the votes of almost all of the young people in the United States, almost all of the Muslim people in the United States, and he knows he ain't getting many of either next time round in less than 12 months from now. Keir Starmer used to get 90% of the votes of Britain's 3 million Muslims. Next time round, he'll be lucky to get 9%. Fewer still, if I have anything to do with it in London and elsewhere. These people know that they backed the wrong horse. They backed the horse that murders people in churches in Gaza. They back the horse that murders refugees in tents outside hospitals. They back the horse that has now dropped three, three Hiroshima's of explosive on a captive people in a tiny piece of land. They backed the horse that is absolutely unapologetically declaring its intention of genocide, placing all of them at risk in the courts in Europe and in their own countries as being jointly and severally responsible for that genocide. They have made a ghastly, gigantic error of judgment, but it was ineluctable because when they locked themselves for some crazy, twisted reason, into an ironclad alliance with Benjamin Netanyahu, they were always bound to go down with him, and down with him they are going to go. The politicians come and go. The clerics stick around a bit longer, and they're struck dumb attitude towards the slaughter in the Holy Land renders them null and void, surely on the judgment day, if not here in this life. The politicians that have done this and now risk sending an armada into the Red Sea, what could possibly go wrong? The German Navy has taken to sea in war. What could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you what will go wrong. The people of Yemen, the ragged, poor, hungry people of Yemen, the purest people on the earth, will destroy their ships, just like they have destroyed cargoes, either from or to the Israeli genocidal regime. Of all the Arabs, of all the Arab countries, only Yemen, the poorest of them, only Yemen, the purest of them, has been ready to sacrifice their own blood to come to the aid of the Palestinian people. When this chapter is finally written in history, the name of the people of Yemen and their armed forces will be written in the stars in glory. And unfortunately, not many others will be able to claim the same. It's the same politicians that dragged us in to the war with Ukraine. You remember that? You'd be forgiven for having forgotten it because they're all hoping that you forget it. They're all hoping that with Russia advancing today five kilometers across a 1,000 kilometer front, there's nothing to stop the Russian advance except President Putin's decisions themselves. NATO can't stop them. Ukraine, its proxy, cannot stop them. Russia will go as far as it wants to go despite the expenditure 
of more than 150 billion euros and dollars in the last two years on a war which undereducated oafs like me was able to tell them would end exactly as it is now ending. These people told us they were winning the war. One more heave, one more set of tanks, one more set of aircraft, another 10, 20, 40 billion dollars worth of ammunition, and Russia would be destroyed, broken. Putin had cancer, heart failure, brain hemorrhages, arms paralyzed, body doubles. He's already dead in the Kremlin. The Daily Mail told us he was, in, he was dead in a freezer. The Russians were making their weapons out of vulcanized washing machines. Ladies in Kiev were throwing tins out of their window and bringing down Russian aerial weapons. It was all a lie. All of it was a lie. As we here on the mother of all talk shows told you repeatedly throughout the last two years, they are lying through their teeth. And the facts on the ground are very different and will be more different still by the end of this conflict. And by dragging you into what has turned out to be a catastrophic blunder in the Ukraine, Russia has been made stronger. Russia and China have become indissoluble. And your economy has been wrecked. Wrecked. It has been destroyed. Your industrial capacity your energy supplies, your ability to trade in the world has been wrecked in the service of Joseph Biden. Imagine, how will your grandchildren even begin to understand how you reduced yourself to a vassal of such an empty vessel as Joseph Biden. Now, not that nothing's getting done in the US Senate. Well, at least somebody's getting done in the US Senate. These leaders of the world, these paragons of virtue, are making pornographic movies of their young interns being humped over a desk in the Senate chamber itself. As someone who once sat in the august halls of the U.S. Senate, I was shocked, shocked that such a thing could happen there. But again, when the history comes to be written, this will be a morality tale. Don't blame that young boy. It was all going on behind his back. But the politicians who have created such an atmosphere in Rome, in the new Rome of corruption, of vice, of evil and wickedness, hoping that others, like the Ukrainians, will be their mercenaries, keeping the empire ever intact, are utterly, utterly exposed. When the history of this time comes to be written, that boy bending over on the Senate desk for one of the most moralistic senators in all of the United States' history will be as emblematic as Nero fiddling while Rome burns of those fornicating as Pompeii and its lava cascades towards them, ready to overwhelm them. At least that's what I think. You can tell me what you think. You can call me. You can send messages. Because this is, after all, the global university of the airwaves. Stay tuned for the best guests. 
and the best calls. One and hour and forty minutes. Do you know how many people watch MSNBC? If this was a normal business, it would be out of business long ago. Do you know how many people watch CNN? We are in danger of fixating too much on the liberal hegemony of media outlets with infinitesimally small viewership. This show that you are watching has 10 times the viewership, 10 times the viewership of Rupert Murdoch's talk TV with its budget of billions. So, you know, let's not lose hope. Let's be our own media. You're right, not everybody watches me, watches those other people that you watch. Well, it's your job and it's everybody else's job that's watching this and agrees with me this evening. It's your job to tell as many other people as you possibly can what we are all about, how to find us, encourage them, and check up afterwards whether they took your advice, and if they didn't, encourage them all over again. Have you any idea how we would multiply if everybody watching this did that? The best part of two million people will watch this program over the next seven days. If those nearly two million spoke to one other person, we'd be three million if their advice was taken. And so on and exponentially on, it is possible to go. It's in our hands, let's do it. I can't do much more than what I'm doing. I need you, the audience, to spread the word. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Should Piers Morgan be sacked over phone hacking lies? Answer yes or no on my telegram. That's t.me forward slash George Galloway on my Twitter, on my YouTube community poll and on my YouTube stream. 28,000 people have voted already. Have your say and let have him gone. If you want to call, uh, it's free of charge in the US and Canada. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. In the UK and Ireland, equally free, it's 0808196552. And if you're in the rest of the world, it's 0044203966265. This is the 300th edition of the Mother of All Talk Shows. And we've saved one of the very best guests for that edition. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti has become a Palestinian icon, which I kind of knew when I first met him in a field in the West Bank. Um, I don't know, 35 or more years ago, maybe nearer to 40. Dr. Mustafa, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. I was making the point earlier that the mother of two parishioners, of the Holy Family Church in Gaza rather confounds the narrative of Western propagandists in multiple ways, doesn't it? Sure. And uh, <clears throat> what happened there is uh, drastic. First of all, it's nice to be with you, George, again. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in your show. And uh, what happened in this uh, church in Gaza is totally drastic. Uh, a mother and a daughter uh, who were uh, in the church were shot at by Israeli snipers and killed. Seven others were also uh, shot and injured. 
And uh, it's not the first time this church is attacked. It was bombarded before, and uh, that took the lives of many people, about 20. So we are talking here about an Israeli behavior which knows, knows no limits, has no limits, and for them, no human being is uh, has a value in Palestine, whether it's Muslim or Christian or anybody else. And the big question here is to the Western countries that claim to uh, protect human rights and advocate for international law and who are allowing Israel to commit all these crimes without any kind of accountability. Three war crimes in parallel a war crime of genocide, the war crime of ethnic cleansing, and the war crime of collective punishment. Up till now, by the way, the number of Palestinians killed, if we count the people under the rubble, is no less than 26,000 people, including 10,000 children. This is a shame for all these Western governments who have supported Israel, provided Israel with weapons, and who continue to reject the idea of a complete and total ceasefire immediately in Gaza. Of course, this uh, all crystallized in the week uh, when the Israeli army shot dead three people walking towards them waving a white flag, killed them in cold blood only to discover they were escaped Israeli hostages. In other words, whoever walks towards them waving a white flag is there to be murdered in cold blood. It's only bad luck from the point of view of the uh, Israeli occupation force that they turned out to be Israelis. Absolutely, but uh, the, the, uh, the meaning of what has happened is very, is very important. It showed to the whole world how Israel would treat any Palestinian. Because their assumption is that these three people were Palestinians. So even if a Palestinian is trying to surrender, waving a white flag and completely undressed, he will still be shot. Uh, these people were without clothes. I mean, uh, I think if they took off their clothes to show that they don't carry any weapons, knowing the Israeli army, and they thought that this would help. And they used the, 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 the waved with white flags, thinking the Israelis would, would not shoot them. But even this one of them screamed in Hebrew, it seems, and still they shot them. They shot them because the Israelis have no respect for the human life of any Palestinian. And they thought they were Palestinians. And actually, that reminds us with another case which happened not long time ago in the West Bank, actually in the city of Jerusalem, when there was a military Palestinian operation. Two Palestinians were killed, and the Israeli uh, army people were shooting at them. And then there was a third Israeli, another Israeli, who, uh, who, who, who kneeled on, his, on the ground when he saw that the soldiers are shooting, and he raised his hands and started screaming that he was an Israeli, but they still shot him because they thought he's a Palestinian. So even if a, if a Palestinian supposedly surrendering, they will still kill him. And that explains, I mean, the other day we had another case uh, in Hebron where a man who is mentally uh, challenged uh, was attacked by Israeli soldiers who beat them and insult him and humiliate him. And then from the distance of zero, one of them shot him uh, in, the, in the chest. This is the kind of Israeli behavior towards Palestinians. So what happened with these Israeli soldiers only reveals the kind of attitude and rules that this army has. And then their chief of staff appears on TV and says something so silly saying that he wishes there will be another opportunity so that the Israeli army would deal in a different way. Of course, he's thinking of another three Israelis who would come out uh, uh, from their hostages. Uh, th this is, uh, I, I think, the Israeli behavior, the Israeli army behavior is nothing but disgusting when it comes to how much they don't respect human lives and people's lives. And, and by the way, George, it's important to remind everybody that they have killed already in, in Gaza 91 
journalists. And one of them was killed uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, who's a Jazeera correspondent for no reason. He was associating, uh, he was working with a team of first aid for, with an ambulance, and they shot him and they shot the other correspondent of Al Jazeera uh, and uh, who was badly injured. This is the kind of behavior of these people. Now, we talked about what happened in the Holy Family Church. Uh, there was another spectacular uh, in a mosque in the West Bank uh, where Hamas are not in control and where Israelis took over the mosque. What happened next? They came into the mosque, <clears throat> they destroyed things, and then the, one of the soldiers took the microphone uh, and started doing uh, or uh, started saying uh, is a <clears throat> Jewish prayer inside the Muslim site, inside the mosque, knowing that uh, this is a kind of humiliation or insulting to the Palestinian people. Uh, the, 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 not only that happened, even when some Israeli uh, army people tried to ap apologize for that and uh, saying that uh, the soldier will be accountable. Today, the Minister of Interior Security, Bing Veer, the well-known fascist, declared that he's very proud of that soldier who did this thing to the mosque in Jenin. Uh, as you can see, it's a whole system. It's not just the behavior of one or another. And uh, today, the West Bank is subjected to terrible harassment by Israeli soldiers, by Israeli policemen, and by Israeli settlers. It looks like every soldier and every settler thinks that they have a green light to shoot Palestinians or at least harass them. And that explains why up till now we had more than 300 Palestinians killed. Today, five of them were killed in Nur Shams camp in Tulkarim. <clears throat> and uh, 22 of those were killed by Israeli legal settlers who are behaving and, and attacking Palestinians with the protection of the Israeli army. Now, uh, Netanyahu is beginning to pay a price with his own public uh, <clears throat> over the hostage story. Uh, it's reported uh, that the head of the Mossad has been dispatched back uh, to uh, Qatar. I don't know how they'll explain the uh, systemic murder of Al Jazeera staff uh, in the last uh, 70 days, but he's gone back to Qatar uh, to resume negotiations about uh, a prisoner exchange. Do you expect anything might come from that? Only if Israel accepts a complete and total ceasefire. Without that, there will be no exchange of prisoners. And without that, because Hamas understands the game, uh, Netanyahu and his crowd uh, want to get back all their uh, hostages, as they call them. And I, many of them are actually prisoners of war, if you consider that they are military people who were uh, arrested or uh, uh, detained during uh, military action. Uh, so they are prisoners of war. That's how they should be called if Netanyahu is declaring a war on Gaza. Uh, but their go the game that Israel plays is that they want to get back all their hostages uh, and then continue the destruction and, dis and, and attack on Gaza, trying to achieve what they haven't been able to achieve, which is total ethnic cleansing of Gaza Strip and pushing people out of Gaza to Egypt. This has been the original plan. This is really the real plan of Netanyahu. Uh, Hamas, on the other side, understands the situation and says there will be no exchange of prisoners anymore till Israel stops the war. Not just temporary ceasefire, but a permanent and guaranteed ceasefire, which means ending this military action against the people of Gaza. If they do so, then there will be a possibility for exchange of prisoners. And it could be in one of two forms. Either all Israeli prisoners will return home safe in exchange of releasing all the Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails, whose number is now more than 8,000 people, uh, or that could be partial, which means part of the Israeli uh, prisoners could be exchanged with a certain part of 
Palestinian prisoners. That, 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 that is the only way to get out of this. Netanyahu has failed, and uh, under the pressure of families of prisoners, he is now accepting to send his, to send his envoy. But uh, don't uh, misunderstand Netanyahu. Netanyahu might use that uh, just as a maneuver to cover up his position, because this man is capable of killing all the Israeli hostages. He doesn't care about them. He, he already he killed 19 of them through bombardment, and the three others who were shot by the Israeli army uh, yesterday. Uh, Netanyahu doesn't care about them. All Netanyahu cares about is to stay in power, and that's why he wants this war to continue. Once the war stops, he will go to jail. Why? For two reasons. First of all, he will be dismissed from his position as prime minister because of his failures on the 7th of October, uh, his military failure, his uh, intelligence failure, and his political failure, uh, but also because there are four cases of corruption against Netanyahu, and one of them is in process now. Uh, so from the position of prime minister, he has only one way to go to, the jail and the prison. And that's why he wants, this man is ready to commit any crime to have this war continues and even to expand it to the West Bank, if he could, or to Lebanon as well. Now, in the hypothetical, uh, your relative, my friend, Marwan Barghouti, uh, he's number one on the list of prisoners to be exchanged. What would be the consequences of his release? I ask you this, in no wish to sow division at this critical time. But most friends of Palestine recognize that the Palestinian leadership badly needs renovation. And Marwan Barghouti would be the obvious uh, method by which that renovation uh, could begin. You have anything to say on that? Sure, Mar Marwan is my friend too, and we're even uh, not only friends, but we're also relatives, as you know. And I knew him very well, and uh, he's a patriotic man, and he's also a man who believes, uh, as I do, in national unity of Palestinians. So if he is released, hopefully, he will help uh, put Fatah on the right track uh, and liberate it from, hopefully, liberate it from the domination of the Palestinian Authority, which has dragged Fatah into a difficult position, really. And uh, maybe he will help in, uh, uh, us in bridging the gaps between all Palestinian groups and create a true national unity, and also uh, in creating a collective Palestinian leadership, uh, national unity, uh, national unified leadership, and uh, a unified collective leadership which can encounter the problems we are facing today and this huge threat uh, to Palestinians, which is larger, in my opinion, than what happened in the Nakba in 1948. Because the real goal of this Israeli uh, attack on Palestinians is really the liquidation of the Palestinian cause completely. So, yes, I hope he will be released. I hope also Ahmad Saadat from PFLP will be released uh, and all other prisoners. Uh, some of them, like Nael Barghouti, my relative also, has been in jail for 43 years. Uh, this is the longest ever time in prison for any political prisoner. Amen. Uh, finally, doctor, and I'm grateful for your time. I know you have a lot on your plate. Uh, please, David please. Cameron and Anna Baerbock uh, have, uh, appear to have moved uh, the British and German positions. Uh, on a ceasefire. I don't know if you're fully across that. I'm not entirely myself. But on the headline, it looks like the British and German governments have uh, moved. Is that significant in your view? It is very significant, of course. From supporting Israel 100% and totally, now there is a change uh, uh, by the foreign minister of Germany as well as the one from Britain. Uh, in the article they've written, uh, I think, in the Sunday Times, in which they've expressed this view. Uh, but that's not enough, because uh, I'm not sure that the Chancellor of Germany is in that position yet. 
Uh, I'm not sure if Sunak also is in that position yet. So we need to see a clearer statement, not only by these two foreign ministers in an article, but a clear position of the both government, uh, both governments uh, that they support immediate permanent ceasefire, not just temporary ceasefire and not just humanitarian ceasefire, but a permanent end of this terrible war and this terrible aggression on the Palestinian people. We need to see that. But so far, Britain with the United States had the worst record in the United Nations, especially the uh, veto uh, that they've used several times. And also the, in the last uh, UN uh, in Security Council resolution, United Nations uh, in, at the United Nations, Britain uh, uh, voted, uh, did not support the resolution, abstained. And the United States, of course, vetoed it. So now we need pressure on the United States as well. And I hope that we will see an official statement by both German and British government saying that they've changed their mind because an article is not enough. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, thank you as always for that insight, for those words of wisdom. Dr. Barghouti from uh, Palestine, from the West Bank. Should Piers Morgan be sacked over the phone hacking lies? Almost 29,000 people have voted. Let's get that over 30,000 because the result is overwhelming. 94%, 91%, 90%, 93%. Yes. And so what matters now is the number of those who have voted. Let me take a quick break and then it's your calls right up to the hour. Stay tuned. You don't get to call me far right. You don't get to call me that on my own show. A lifelong socialist, the leader of a socialist party, the Workers' Party of Britain, with an Indonesian wife, with five mixed-race children, with a record of fighting racism all of my life, representing more people of color in the British Parliament than anyone in history by a country mile. You don't get to call me far right. These kind of idiotic insults tossed around by infantile leftists who think that anyone to the right of them is a fascist, is a racist. They are the cause of the crashing and burning of what used to be called the left. They are the cause of it. They have discredited leftism with their foolish, idiot isms and ists and smears that emanate from them like a bad smell. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Let's hit the phone lines. Diana is in Italy on Palestine. Told you it was the Global University of the Airwaves. Diana, welcome. Hello. Hello, George. Thank you. Uh, I'm a UK citizen living in Italy, very ashamed of my country. Uh, two quick points. One, one of the young lads who were killed by the Israeli forces seemed to have bright red hair, surely that would have given them pause for thought. I don't know many Palestinians who have bright red hair. Uh, the other point is, are you slightly concerned, as I am, or very concerned, that the Arab nations don't seem to be doing much to try and stop or, or show that, uh, what they think about what's going on in Israel, apart from the Houthis? Well, um, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Diana, uh, if I may uh, diverge uh, from you. There are actually a lot of Palestinians, Lebanese, and Syrians uh, with red hair, even blonde hair. Uh, the genetic footprint of the Crusades uh, was a large one. Uh, so the red hair wouldn't have been uh, the giveaway that perhaps you thought. Uh, but the white flag uh, ought to have been. 
The fact that they were naked and obviously unarmed ought to have been a giveaway. And uh, what's evident is that these uh, invaders are in a murderous rampage and that they are ready to murder anything that crosses their path, especially uh, someone who is not armed. That's an easy kill. Uh, and they're not having much luck against those that are armed in the very same places. So I surmise that what they did, they did out of the frenzy. There may have been drugs involved. There are always drugs involved when it comes to the uh, Israeli armed forces. I'm sorry to say uh, that uh, much of their uh, mass murder is drug fueled. Uh, this is uh, not the most moral army in the world, but the most immoral army in the world. This is a debauched army of people who would rather be on the beach and find themselves in the alleyways of uh, Gaza. As to the uh, Arab countries, I prefer to accentuate the positive. And that's why I hailed the people of Yemen. Uh, we shouldn't call them Houthis. That's what the enemy wants us to call them. This is the masses of tens of millions of Yemenis, the poorest, the purest of all the Arabs, who have done more than any other Arab country, any other Arab country, to come to the aid of the Palestinians, and glory to them for that. Thanks for the call, Diana. Saira is in Derbyshire in England on the same subject. Uh, go ahead, Saira. Good evening, George. I'd just like to wish you and your family yeah. a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Um, I'd also like to Thank let you, you know that I'm on your Patreon and I also donate a fiver a week to Mott, so I do support you very much. Oh, wonderful. God bless you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, I'd like to say that uh, just to give the Palestinians some hope that um, where I used to live in Leek in Staffordshire, there is quite a strong Palestinian group. And they did do a vigil yesterday, and I'm going to see one of the ladies, and they actually get products from Palestine. So I'm going to be buying some of that. So there's hope there. And I understand that there's quite a strong group in Nottingham, and they do demonstrations as well. And I've been giving donations, etc. And I just want the Palestinian people, especially the Palestinian people in Gaza, to know that... Uh, you know, we British people do support them. We do care about them. And it's just breaking my heart to see what's happening in Gaza at the moment. I, I have some Facebook friends on Gaza, and they're telling me horrendous stories. They've lost so many family members, and it's absolutely tragic what's happening. Um, one of my Gaza Facebook friends had to go into Egypt to get his eyes treated couldn't get it in Gaza and uh, somebody I, I met who gave a talk a few years ago uh, lives in the West Bank had to go to Jordan before he could even get home to the West Bank and it's absolutely shocking what's happening yeah we've we've never seen anything quite like this Sarah uh, and your sincerity shines uh, through your call through your words. Uh, I just watched before the show uh, a video, short video that my, my own wife has made referencing our own uh, children. Uh, and, and actually it made me cry uh, with, the, with the power of what she said. And I think that uh, all of us are feeling the same way. There you are in, uh, in Derbyshire, in Nottingham, uh, there was uh, a march yesterday in Little Burton-on-Trent. Uh, they asked me to speak at it. I couldn't because I'm very far away from England right now. But uh, there it is. Uh, that's Burton-on-Trent. Uh, so all over this country and all over almost every country, uh, the people have voted with their feet. That's why David Cameron has shifted the British government's position. 
because they can feel the strength of the anger and, and the broken hearts all over our country and other countries to Sarah. Thank you. Pardon me very much for that. 29,000 people have now voted. Uh, should Piers Morgan be sacked over phone hacking lies? Get your vote in. Let's get that over uh, 30,000. Here's an email from Lamsky, uh, Lamsky Garbett. George, your anger pierces my soul. The political elite of the West are indeed satanic, greedy, black-hearted, self-serving, profit-obsessed murderers. There is no cheer. It is devoid of consumerism. Where are the peacemakers? God help Palestine. God bless you, Lamsky, for that. Let's go to Dunstable in England, where Susie wants to talk about Israel-Palestine. Go ahead, Susie. Oh, hello, George. Thank you so much for being you and for being the leading light. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have uh, two two questions. Um, one is, you know, when mm. is this bombing going to end? Which I suppose no one's going to know. But then when I was thinking this question, I follow on Telegram uh, another uh, company, uh, organisation called Not On The Beeb. And um, they, they had this, uh, it was called Welcome to Nova Katif, N-O-V-A-K-A-T-I-F. And it, I'll just read it out a little bit. It's not too much. Um, an mm. Israeli real estate yeah. company, which specializes in building illegal settlements on Palestinian land in the West Bank, has a vision and plans for Jewish Israelis to move into Gaza, renaming it Nova Katif. I can go on, and I have sent an email to you. Is this true? Are they just going to bomb and completely raise it to the ground and build well, new, uh, new you, you say, yeah. You say, is it true? Uh, it's certainly true that they would like to do that, uh, but I don't believe that they will be able to do that. The Palestinian resistance in Gaza is undefeated. In fact, an American general just said today, uh, in uh, a very convoluted way of saying this is all greatly disproportionate, uh, that the number of Hamas fighters killed by Israel is of a very, and I'm quoting him, moderate level, moderate to low level, he said, whilst the number of civilians dead, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti said uh, just moments ago, 26,000 dead, 26,000 dead civilians, 10,000 of them children, to kill a moderate to low number of the Palestinian resistance fighters means that uh, these apartments that they would like to build on the beach in Gaza ain't going to be happening anytime soon, Susie. That sounds like an interesting sight, not the Beeb. I must look it up, uh, uh, not on the Beeb. I must look yeah. it up myself. Thank you, Susie, for a lovely call. Not on the BBC. Uh, Simon, uh, a legend, is in Florida. A professorial brilliance every single week here on the Mother of All Talk Shows. Uh, Simon, thank you for joining us again. What have you got to report? Good evening, Mr. Galloway, and greetings to your worldwide audience. It's my distinct pleasure to be with you on your 300th show, and I'd like to have the opportunity to point out this is my 30th okay. time with you, so we, we seem to be in some some degree of synchronicity. But, synchronicity, um, like to... yes. Yeah. Um, on Friday, there was the first trilateral commission uh, not that of infamy, but indeed a new trilateral commission, this one involving the nations of the People's Republic of China, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, once again in Beijing. And um, they were attended, both of those Middle Eastern nations, by significant delegations of technical representatives in order that they could work further on uh, restoring the operation of the agreements that they had renewed, having been delayed for many, many years. And what was interesting here is despite the fact that these were only deputy foreign ministers because their other bosses had respective duties obviously relating to troubles in the region, 
Mr. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister and indeed director of foreign affairs for Chinese politics, be remember, was overseeing the proceedings once again, and the Chinese issued a three-point statement, one very much welcoming the continued uh, cooperation between the Saudis and the Iranians, um, two explaining how that cooperation was going to be expanded to many more um, new areas, not only of politics, but of business and um, culture as well but also making the point that China fully supported them and indeed pushed them to um, have the Islamic world cooperate more and in a much stronger manner to push back against the Israelis, explaining that uh, China would continue to be involved in the region and obviously restating their wishes for a two-state solution. Now, this immediately transfers over to what is going to be occurring tomorrow at the United Nations, where we have learned today that the United Arab Emirates have proposed uh, a further draft resolution, and this time in the form of a booklet as opposed to a page, So it's not only just talking about immediate humanitarian ceasefire, but also the future governance of Palestine and the the need to get in aid through all of the crossings and by air and by sea, which would be uh, quite a change, but also um, many, many other aspects such as um, setting up a monitoring force with an annual remit Um, and very much pushing the Secretary General to work much harder and much faster on the implementation of Resolution 2712, which is um, also about uh, Gaza, in such that he has to report to them what he is doing within five days and then report to the Security Council going forward every 30 days. So this is quite a sea change And it seems to be the first step on the process that you and I had discussed previously, whereby the Israelis and the Americans are essentially being given yet another chance to fail. And if we see an American veto of this, it will be the sixth time since October the 7th and the 36th time since 1970. But we shouldn't forget that today there are constitutional referendums in Chad, which is part of the Sahel, in Chile, which is their second attempt at passing a new um, resolution on a um, constitution, and also the general election in Serbia, which may determine uh, peace in the Balkans. And um, whilst you will obviously be be at some point taking some form of break for Christmas, I'll be continuing to cover these on weaponized news. So that's the um, update so far, and um, I'm Certainly looking forward to listening to your next guest as well. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Simon in Florida. Always a font of knowledge. Uh, Last call before the break. Joe is in Grenada and wants to talk about disinformation. Let's hear from Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, George, I I first, I have to say it is such an honor and a pleasure to be talking with you. And um, I've been an admirer of yours. I'm an American expat, um, and I'm old enough to remember when you did give that amazing testimony before Congress regarding the Iraq War, and I was was just blown away by that. So, but um, the reason I'm calling is that I am, I am deeply troubled. I, I have family back in the U.S. They're very highly educated. They're, um, you know, professional managerial class, let's say, super smart people, and yet they are so benighted when it comes to issues such as, for example, Ukraine. You know, they, they, they think that. Um, 
uh, you know, Putin is an idiot, that he's mm. lost, and, and it's been a disaster for Russia, and so forth. And, I, I mean, how can we combat this, this complete and utter, you know, disinformation war? Because these are, these are, these are very intelligent people, and yet they are, seem to be living in a parallel universe. Yes, it, of course, is dismaying, uh, and Joe, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for your kind words and wishing I was with you in Grenada right now in another lifetime. I was deeply involved uh, with the New Jewel movement, with the late and great Morris Bishop uh, in Grenada. Uh, I remember the day that, that Ronald Reagan invaded it, a Commonwealth country, uh, without so much as a buy your leave from uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was none, uh, none too pleased uh, about it. Uh, but uh, of course it's dismaying uh, when people who should know better, uh, and we must hope and work uh, so that they do know better, uh, behave like sheep uh, rounded up by, by the, the proverbial media sheepdogs. Uh, on to the last journey uh, to the slaughterhouse. It is uh, truly uh, mind-boggling when one uh, comes across an educated person, otherwise uh, well versed in what's happening, but with blind spots on the great strategic questions of our age. All I can say to cheer you up is this. And I've been involved in politics well over 50 years now. There has never been a time where more people knew the truth than there is this day at this time in history. It's still not enough. Uh, last week, 1.8 million people watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows. Look at it this way. If every one of those brought one other listener, think of the beginnings of an exponential rise in audience and in the spreading uh, of the truth of the other side of the story that that would represent. So if I'm going to ask for a Christmas present from all of you, it is this, that every one of you resolves that in January you will bring one other person into our audience of this global university of the airwaves. Other than that, Joe, all we can do is keep on keeping on, as the great Bob Dylan once said. I've overshot the hour. I'm taking a quick break, and then we're back with the one and only Bryce Green, writer and commentator extraordinaire. You don't want to miss him. I promise you. Stay tuned. people today struggle with the common mainstream media consumer. These types of people are mindless zombies. Instead of living authentically, they feed off masking their true thoughts and feelings, doing nothing and criticizing those who actually do their research. This type of media consumer can be highly manipulative, so here are some golden standard clapbacks when they start with their propaganda. When they say you are too much for them, show them a mirror and tell them to look for less. Draw a diagram of where your business is and their business is to visually show them they are in the wrong area. When they say please watch this clip from this reputable BBC journalist, remind them that there are no longer any reputable BBC journalists and to instead watch the mother of all talk shows for some real journalism. The next time you encounter a brainwashed zombie, hold your head high and know their obsession to eat your brain is masking their jealousy of your confidence, your freedom in self-expression, and most importantly, your authenticity. <whistles> Keep listening to learn more on the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway.
Should Piers Morgan be sacked over the phone hacking lies? Seems like a no-brainer to me and to you. 94, 91, 90, 93 percent say yes across the four portals. 29,808 people have voted. Please get your vote in. I'm determined that that should be a poll of more than 30,000 people. Bryce Green is one of the most popular guests that we have here on the mother of all talk shows, independent writer, political analyst, and contributor to fairness. Fairness would be a fine thing. Bryce Green, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. I just noticed during that break uh, that the head of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Zaluzhny, uh, has discovered a listening device in his uh, office. Things are not going too well amongst the uh, ruling circle in Kiev, are they? Uh, no, they are not. And uh, this comes in the long line of these inter Nicene struggles between the Ukrainians amongst themselves. Uh, you know, while they're fighting a war against Russia, they're also fighting uh, something of a war on the home front. Uh, you know, there was all of these stories coming out in the Western press recently about how Zelensky's sort of isolated and that he's a, a madman who's the only one who believes that Ukraine has a shot in this war. Meanwhile, the people around him are uh, trying to talk some sense into him, but uh, there are deep, deep divisions in there. And we've seen the, the sort of violence inside of Ukraine itself escalate as a result of these tensions. Uh, and this also comes as Russia is mounting a a uh, pretty successful counteroffensive in the east of Ukraine. Uh, and so it's impossible to predict the future. But I, what you can say for sure is that what the United States had in mind when they initiated Project Ukraine, uh, at least since 2014 and more recently since 2022, what they've had in mind is not panning out as the way they intended. Uh, Ukraine is not going to be able to achieve the stated goals of the war. Uh, they're going to end up most likely with the peace settlement that looks almost identical to the one that was offered or that was discussed in uh, April of 2022. Uh, only this time, the Russians will likely ask for more. Uh, meanwhile, the sanctions against Russia are, have completely backfired. Uh, there's reporting now in the mainstream press that it's more honest about how exactly the Western war against Russia has failed and that Russia has actually come out uh, mostly on top in this. And so this whole Operation Ukraine, this using Ukraine to overextend and unbalance Russia, as the RAND report uh, suggested all those years ago, using Ukraine in that way has failed. All it's seemed to do is completely destroy Ukrainian society and Ukrainian democracy. That these were trends that people like you and me would point out early in the war, but uh, you know, it seems that now they're willing to listen. Five million Ukrainians have fled the country. The sons and daughters of the rich are uh, in the casinos and bordellos uh, of the flesh pots of Europe and the Caribbean. Uh, but the poor Ukrainians are living as refugees in emergency housing and, uh, and uh, third-rate hotels and so on across uh, uh, Western countries are very unlikely to be going home. 25%, uh, at least, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, of Ukrainian territory is now in the hands of Russia. And they show no signs of stopping. And certainly Ukraine is not able to stop them. I beg to differ uh, with you on one point. I, I, I think Russia will require a lot more uh, than was on the table in Ankara uh, for a peace settlement uh, all these hundreds of thousands of lives ago and all these uh, billions uh, of euros ago. Uh, the, the likely outcome, it seems to me, is a rump stump, uh, frankly, puppet Western Ukrainian state with a government loyal to Moscow. Uh, that seems to me the only way that this war is now going to end. What do you think? Well, I... Mostly agree, although, again, it's difficult to predict the future. Um, all we can say for certain is that when when we look at the Westerns, Western power's stated goal for this war, it was to protect Ukrainian democracy. It was to 
uh, protect the fabric of this nation uh, from destruction. Uh, but I mean, if we look at the actual results of this, uh, the predictable results of this is that a lot of that social fabric has uh, completely disintegrated. Uh, this was reported on a, a bit in the Western press, but uh, mostly in the alternative, uh, that uh, Ukraine's uh, political parties, the opposition parties, have been uh, outlawed. Uh, the climate, the political climate in the country is such that people don't speak out against the government. Uh, and we've seen the, the media become centralized under the state in Ukraine. These are all the sorts of things that we would criticize harshly if they happen in one of our official enemy countries. But uh, since Ukraine is an official ally being used again, like I said, by the Western powers, uh, we don't have any problem with it. We're watching as Ukraine turns into a more authoritarian, a more oligarchic, a more or a less democratic country. Uh, that's what I predict. No matter what the territorial uh, transfers that happen, what no matter what happens on that front, uh, we can say for certain that the entity known as Ukraine isn't going to be the entity known as Ukraine as it was before. It's uh, that's that's gone. It's off the table, and that was a result again of these Western powers. Uh, not only uh, back in, in Turkey when they were negotiating, but, I mean, even as recently as this summer when they were pushing this failed counteroffensive that they knew that they their own intelligence people said the Ukrainians won't be able to uh, succeed and gain all of the territory that they want. In fact, we expect that it'll be a failure. They knew this, and yet they funded it, they pushed the Ukrainians into it, and they watched from the sidelines as... Thousands of Ukrainians died for nothing. Now, imagine if you're a Ukrainian uh, coming back from war, you take the time to look at these media reports, how your government hung you out to dry, how the Americans helped them do it, and how they didn't value your life. You have to come back and integrate into that society again. That's going to have long-lasting consequences uh, for any country, but especially at a beachhead of the new Cold War like Ukraine. Uh, amongst the political prisoners is a one-time regular guest on this show, uh, the American citizen Gonzalo Lira. Uh, Tucker Carlson, the world's most eminent broadcaster, certainly the most widely watched broadcaster, highlighted this monstrosity uh, just a few days ago. The American government hasn't lifted a finger to end the unlawful, unjust incarceration of an American citizen. What kind of puppet government uh, can, can lock up an American citizen without so much as a whimper uh, from the White House? Again, we have a hierarchy of allies, it seems, and a hierarchy of priorities. Uh, America likes to you know, puff out its chest and say that when there's a citizen in danger, we go in and uh, save them, and we do everything our can they can to protect our citizens. You know, we saw this with the uh, Brittany Griner business in Russia. Uh, you know, the U.S. made a big show of uh, doing a lot to try and get her back and uh, chastise the Russians for, you know, uh, you know, interfering in uh, incarceration. Uh, but they don't do that in this case. They don't do that for Gonzalo Lira, and they also don't do that for the American citizens who are still trapped in Gaza. Uh, they don't care about the people who act as dissident voices. They don't care about the people who get in the way of the broader political agenda. And, you know, this goes for all of the stated principles of the American empire. Again, we talk and talk all, all the time about a rules-based order. Uh, but as, you know, the joke goes, the, that order is when America rules and orders people around. Uh, and it doesn't seem like they care about the citizens uh, of their own country when uh, it goes against what that rules-based order, quote-unquote, seems to have in store. And that's just a, a tragic fact about the uh, American myth that we are raised to believe and that uh, all these people are laboring under. It's a, it's a tragedy. As George Carlin said, the American dream, you have to be asleep to believe it. You mentioned Gaza, Bryce. Let me turn to that, if I, if I may. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, I started out this election cycle prepared to park uh, my bemusement at Robert F. Kennedy's stance on 
Israel-Palestine, but that was before a genocidal onslaught was launched against the Palestinian people with ever more unhinged support from Robert F. Kennedy, to the point that, frankly, the only conclusion you could reach, given that a man like him doesn't need money, the only conclusion you could reach is that he is somehow compromised. He is saying things like the Palestinians are the most pampered people on earth. He said that on screen just 48 hours ago. Uh, what on earth is it with the political leadership in your country that is more royal than the king, more Catholic than the Pope, more Israeli than Netanyahu. How, how does that happen? Well, it happens uh, for two very important reasons. The first reason is that Israel represents a major strategic front for the American empire. Everyone understands it, that people in the Middle East have undergone colonialism and uh, you know, all these Western-backed coups and uh, interventions, and it's really left the area decimated. Uh, but one of the major places in the Middle East where the United States has a major influence is Israel. They're able to use it. Uh, I mean, even Robert F. Kennedy himself has said that the, the justification for America's continued support for Israel is that Israel allows America to influence the Middle East. And if America leaves uh, Israel or if Israel is no longer available, then that leaves the vacuum for Russia and China to come into the Middle East. I mean, it's standard neocon stuff. And that's what uh, the American empire mandates. And the politics of American empire trickle down into, you know, everyday life in a lot of different ways, you know, from the surveillance state to the, the way the military industrial complex interacts with jobs. But it trickles down on an ideological level, too. People need to find justifications for empire. And right now that one of those justifications is uh, Zionism. And one of the other major reasons is uh, historical is that the Israel lobby in America is so powerful that it rivals the lobby of oil, it rivals the, the lobby of Wall Street, it rivals all the other major lobbies in the country. Uh, and that uh, has a tremendous effect on Congress and the presidents and think tanks and all the other power centers in Washington. Uh, it becomes very easy to support uh, Israel when the cost of going against Israel is extremely high. And the Israel lobby is able to make that cost extremely high. Uh, now, the case of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is interesting because he has billed himself uh, largely as an outsider of the American political system, uh, a maverick who's willing to speak truth to power. And that's how he's, he, he's campaigned. That's how he's billed himself. But at a crucial moment, in the American empire at a crucial moment when 20,000 people are being massacred, uh, when Israel is talking about not discriminating between civilians and uh, militants, uh, when Israel has said that they want to thin out the population of Gaza, that they're fighting human animals, uh, Robert F. Kennedy has decided to uh, go along with what the establishment says. His positions are virtually identical to Joe Biden, virtually identical to Donald Trump. In fact, you could even say that Joe Biden is more moderate uh, on Israel than RFK Jr., given that you actually have heard Biden say that the, Israel's bombing is indiscriminate. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that he wants to continue supporting it. Uh, and I'm sure that there are a lot of international uh, tribunals who will be very interested in that quote later. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, RFK Jr. has never issued uh, that condemnation. He's never said that it the bombing is discriminate. And so you have to wonder why. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, reasons that uh, his campaign is influenced by the Israel lobby. Uh, that's just one of the truisms of American politics. But the fact that he chose to be around those people means that uh, if he is talking about peace, if he is talking about security, if he is talking about, you know, uh, issuing the world into a multipolar order, uh, this is completely counterproductive to those aims. Uh, you cannot have a multipolar world order uh, while you're supporting uh, the genocide of Palestinians. You can't have a multipolar world order when uh, you are standing against the entire rest of the world in the United Nations 
in voting for a ceasefire. Uh, that's not how you achieve peace. That's not how you issue in a new era of new relations. It's completely contradictory to the West of his platform. Uh, so we'll see how the rest of the campaign goes with three Zionists duking it out in the American uh, political arena. It doesn't seem like there'll be any changes in the uh, American political establishment, at least with respect to Israel. That change has to come from below. And one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is organizing. And I encourage that your listeners, if you're not organized already, start organizing. There's only one way that you're going to change the way that America behaves towards Israel. And then you're going to have to force it. You're going to have to get together with like-minded people, uh, find things that you can do in your community, uh, get together, build coalitions, and do it. That's the only way. Uh, watching, watching alternative media is important. George is very important, but it's not enough. We have to get out there. We have to get out onto the streets. And beyond the streets, we got to get out there into the meetings and the organizations and the institutions that will allow us to combat uh, the, uh, the Zionist political machine. Well said. Uh, at least something's getting done in the U.S. Senate, Bryce. Uh, uh, sex uh, orgies filmed for the edification. I mean, it's, this is like the last days of Pompeii, isn't it? What on earth went wrong? I, I got to say, I, I do agree with, uh, I think it was my friend Katie Halp who said at least something is getting done uh, in, in, on Washington. I personally don't care. A lot of worse things than that goes on in those rooms. A lot of evil decisions are made. And if, you know, some love is being made on those tables, well, then I think that we should rejoice that maybe those rooms aren't as evil as we seem to think. <laughs> Jolly liberal of you. Bryce Green, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Should Piers Morgan be sacked over phone hacking lies? 30,235 people have voted, and the result is overwhelmingly a yes. Let's take a short break, then it's your calls, but I get to see my good wife, Gayatri. She's coming up next. Stay tuned. A new dawn has broken, has it not? He had that Clinton thing. His eyes were round and big and smiley, and he was very charming. He became this incredible pop idol kind of prime minister. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. New Labour was backed by the most powerful media interests because they realised he was representing them. He was caught red-handed trading policy in return for hard cash from a businessman. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Both of Bush as well as Tony Blair are now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust. Morgan paid him off for the Iraq war. The man is a war criminal. Is Tony Blair a war criminal? In my opinion, yes. Most definitely. The pursuit of money has become the dominant theme in your life. All these relationships are, in most people's estimation, corrupt relationships. No previous Labour Prime Minister has behaved in this shameful, money-grubbing way. How do you sleep at night? You know, it's that. It's as a person. The Holy Father, the Pontiff, Pope Francis, denounces Israel's murder of two parishioners of the Holy Family Catholic Church in Gaza. He described it as terrorism. I wonder if we might get a word from that paragon of Christian virtue, the Archbishop of Canterbury, over this matter. Uh, that film, in fact, both of my films, Killing Kelly and the Killings of Tony Blair are yours gratis if you will support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway for less than the price of a cup of tea per week. You can support my work and allow me to support 
my family, I hope you think I'm worth that. And if you do and you can, please sponsor me on Patreon. Less than the price of a cup of tea. Let's uh, take a call from Rhode Island on Ukraine from Zoya. Zoya, welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Hi, Mr. Galloway. Well, I just had a couple of historical notes that I've been thinking about since Russia went into Ukraine. And the first one that okay. I don't think Westerners, particularly Americans, don't quite grasp is what happens to the countries or people who back essentially Russophobic Ukrainians. Uh, the first example being Sviatopolk, when he fought Yaroslav the Wise, he fled to the Polish king who backed him, and that dynasty fell rather shortly thereafter. Mozepa, who turned on Peter the Great to fight with the Swedes, the Swedes lost their power. He fled to Poland. Shortly after that, Poland was partitioned. And then Ketlura, um, who was more Bolshevik phobic, but still kind of Russophobic. He was a Ukrainian nationalist, at least. He fled to Poland, and that independent Poland didn't last more than 20 years. Um, so that was kind of one of those, if history doesn't repeat but rhymes, how's that going to work out for us now? Second <clears throat> historical note was, especially with what's going on in Gaza as well, is nobody seems to investigate why it was we had these genocidal ethno-nationalisms from Hitler, Bandera, and Herzl. And all three of those people were born in pre-World War I Austro-Hungary. What is it about Austro-Hungary and 19th century Austro-Hungary that still has a hold on us? It's a very, very good question. Uh, beyond, uh, I suspect, the uh, parameters of tonight's show, but one worth exploring. Uh, as someone uh, once joked, uh, the Austro-Hungary War, who won uh, the Holy Roman Empire, neither Holy Roman nor an empire. What was the answer to the Schleswig-Holstein question? All of these big shadows that were cast uh, from uh, that era, from that area, uh, are uh, well worth exploring, but probably not on this busy night. The point you make, though, Zoya, was exemplified in President Putin's statement reported today. He said that Finland never had any problem with Russia. None. Until now that it has joined NATO. And NATO will wish to place its weaponry, including its missiles, including its nuclear missiles, literally a river away from St. Petersburg. And so Putin has today re-established, and listen to this word, this name, Putin has re-established the Leningrad District Military Committee meaning that a new military center will be established called Leningrad, just across the river from Finland. Be careful what you wish for, you NATO fools. Zoya, thanks for that call. Comments tonight on Piers Morgan. Uh, Uzi, one millimeter, says, how has Piers Morgan even kept his job so long anyway? He's a complete bell end and nobody likes him. Same goes for Richard Maidley, the shoplifter. Uh, Convex Fungus says, send Piers to Gaza in his underwear, holding a white flag. And Mike Lee says, Piers Morgan should be arrested and questioned. As well, he might be. Shug the Hoopy Dug, 1888. That means that Shug's a Celtic supporter. Morgan has no credibility whatsoever. And Juma says, agreed, send Piers to Gaza. Let him see what his beloved Israel does. Jeff is on the line in Michigan on JFK, or maybe RFK, or maybe both. Jeff, welcome. What would you like to say? We have to get out onto the streets and beyond the streets. we got to get up there into the meetings and the organizations and the institutions that will allow us to combat 
Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, you need to switch off, uh, <laughs> switch off the show before you can participate in it. Uh, email from Enrique. I think the Gaza Strip should be called the Gaza Ghetto. First, because it's a more accurate description, and secondly, since it would draw attention to the clear similarity to the Warsaw Ghetto tragedy in the 1940s. Not a tragedy, but a crime, Enrique. And I myself regularly uh, compare the two, uh, for the comparison is inescapable. I was watching the new uh, World War II documentary series on Netflix last night, uh, colored and restored some astoundingly brilliant footage from the Second World War, spoiled by the absurdly uh, uh, Anglo-centric spin on the war of the narrative, uh, the absurdly uh, underestimated contribution of the Red Army and the Soviet Union, uh, to the point of laughability, to be honest. Uh, I mean, the Red Army liberated almost all of the death camps but the only liberation of death camps in the documentary are the very few that were liberated by the United States. Anyone arriving from Mars or any young person who doesn't know better uh, would conclude from the new Netflix series that Britain and the United States won the war. There's no hint of the 26 million dead Russians that actually won the Second World War. Terence is in Norwich, wants to talk about the new world order. Go ahead, Terence. Uh, good evening, Mr. Gallery. I hope you and you are well. Um, I've been listening to a number of okay. comments tonight, and my one of my favourites over the last couple of years have been trying to expose the brutality in Yemen, and I like what was said earlier about the people of Yemen. It's not about what faith you are. They are resolutely for fairness. They've been starved, they've been bombed, they've been trying to be culled by Britain, France, Saudi Arabia, and America. This has to change. A, this dog will not lie down, and they're carrying the truth. My point is, where do you see the so-called United Nations? I think there should be a simple vote. The majority rules. Ceasefire, majority, it's called. I'd like your opinion, Mr. Galloway, please. Well, uh, of course, the central dilemma, Terence, uh, and I'll come back to Yemen in a minute, uh, is that you can only change the rules of the United Nations if nobody vetoes that change to the rules. And as any change to the rules will lessen the power of those with a veto, uh, any change is null and void. It's dead in the water. Uh, my own view is that the United Nations is defunct. I know that good friends of mine, like Mark Seddon, will find it very painful to hear me say that. Uh, there are people, very good people, who still have some faith in the United Nations. But I think an organization in which a huge number, the largest ever number, a three-figure number of United Nations officials have been murdered in 70 days in a war launched by a member of the United Nations. And yet the United Nations can do nothing about it isn't any kind of organization. An organization has to have some sanction against those uh, who murder its employees. Imagine being in a golf club uh, and uh, a group of members were going around murdering the officials of the golf club. But the golf club can do nothing about it. It is obscene. Uh, I think it's a busted flush. If it was up to me, I'd establish a parallel United Nations that would be based around the nascent, emerging uh, organizations around the SCO, around the, uh, uh, around the BRICS, uh, around the new world order uh, that is uh, emerging. Uh, and to hell, let the Anglo-Saxons uh, play with themselves in their own international organization, but I'm open to persuasion on it. Terence, you raised the great people of Yemen and rightly made the point. You see, there are fools uh, who can be won to a position of hating the Yemenis uh, because they're so-called Houthis. Uh, 
somewhere between uh, Shiite and Sunni Islam. Uh, the Zaidis, that's their religion. Uh, it is a trend uh, within Islam. But they are Muslims, speaking the purest form of Arabic, and following more purely than anybody else uh, the tenets of the Quran. They are an Arab nationalist people, and always have been since the time of uh, uh, Colonel Nasser and the great uh, uh, United Arab Republic, which sought to include uh, Yemen in their, uh, in their number. Uh, one of my earliest memories in 1967, so I'm 13 years old, is watching British soldiers in kilts, wearing tartan around their hats, gunning down Yemenis in the port of Aden. It's one of the earliest and most graphic memories I have. Uh, the Scottish soldiers were led by a madman, literally a madman. He was called, called himself Mad Mitch, Mad Mitchell, Colonel Colin Mitchell. But the British got their ass kicked out of Aden, out of Yemen. And I have the highest possible reverence for the great people of Yemen. I always did, and I sure do now. Terence, thank you for that call. I can't uh, delay. I've got to see my wife, Gayatri, on the line now with the social media update. What's rattling, Gayatri? So the people on Patreon have been voting as well on the poll. Uh, the comments are um, interesting. Richard Paquette says, if we start sacking public people for lying to the public, well, Morgan is way down the list of the guilty. The White House, 10 Downing, lying to the people is now expected in the West. And Morgan is but an entertainer. Sancho Relaxo says, is there a more elegant and succinct term for pompous, disposable, talking head, useful idiot, George? For surely he is it. And James Lenahan says, go ahead and sack him. But if the US is any model, he will be replaced by someone just as bad. Merry Christmas from Fort Collins in Colorado. Spike says, these days, wow. just because a judge rules doesn't mean the judge is right. I don't really like Pierce, but he has some pretty good interviews with interesting people, so I say no. And then our friend in Liverpool, Scouser Lar says, he won't get sacked. He's a gutter journalist, well suited to a gutter news channel. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I get that some people uh, think he's an entertainer. I wasn't that entertained to discover that he was hacking my telephone. Uh, that was not remotely entertaining to me. And he hacked many other people's telephones. And he's only been caught out by the court. And it wasn't the judge, by the way. Uh, this was the judgment of the court that he had lied. He lied under oath at the Levinson inquiry. And the police will now be interviewing him about that. And uh, he has lied throughout that he never knew that his people who were coming up with these stories were hacking people's phones in order to get them. There's nothing entertaining about that. I accept that he's a gutter journalist in a gutter media, uh, but he is a very high profile one. And I think you're being naive if you think that he has done any kind of service by dragging, blinking into the searchlights the likes of Jeremy Corbyn and nailing them to a cross over the issue of Hamas and the Palestinians. Anyway, go on, please, Gatry, any more? Wayne Perrell says, kudos, George, on your 300th modes. You are a lighthouse of honest news in the sea of disinformation. Bless you. And Jack Quark says, okay. George Galloway okay. remains one of the OG natural born troublemakers. More, please. Congratulations to you and the team on 300 episodes. And um, of course, um, we are all very uh, happy and proud of our 300th episode. Uh, thanks to our team uh, um, who know that we were supposed to have a Christmas slash 300 episode mo mother of all parties. 
but which had to be rescheduled due to our unexpected visit to the UAE. Uh, but yes, so um, more, more, more shows. <laughs> More and more. Thank you very much indeed, Gayatri. Kiss the children for me, please. Let's go back to the lines. Uh, Ahmed is in Australia. And it's very early in the morning there. Good morning, Ahmed. Good morning, George. Uh, salam alaikum. Wa oh, alaikum salam. I, uh, I, um, I just want to ask one, uh, one question, or maybe a statement also after that. But um, I don't know if you're aware of that um, the Prime Minister, his son, made a tweet, well, it's called X now, uh, saying the phrase, river to the sea. Now, that is considered an anti-Semitic. If a Palestinian says it, I mean, it's an anti-Semitic, which is transferred into saying that they want to get rid of all Jews from Israel. But if an Israeli or um, a prime minister, especially the son of, uh, of the prime minister, says that, that's, that's not an issue or an anti-Semitic. I saw this um, uh, because uh, a journalist asked uh, Blinken, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure you saw the video where he was he looked, he actually panicked when they asked him the question. And he couldn't say anything about it. Um, I don't know if you were there or saw it. Um, I just wanted to know a um, response. And congratulations to your 300 um, show. I'm a big fan. Uh, it's early Thank in the morning you. here. Thank it's hard so to much. watch sometimes, but yeah. Thank you, Ahmed, and God bless you and all the great people of Australia. I have many friends there. I spoken to the PAC Town Hall. Uh, of uh, of Sydney, uh, one of the biggest meetings that has ever been held there. Uh, I hold Australia in the highest regard. Uh, some of my own people were uh, were deported there in prison ships. Uh, so uh, it's with great distress that I see uh, the decline of the Australian political class. Uh, I know there were always a, a rum bunch. Bob Hawke was a, a rum fellow, uh, but he was a friend of mine. Uh, and when I see Albanese and compare him to Hawke, uh, when I hear the Australian Labour leaders now and compare them to Gough Whitlam and other Labour leaders past, uh, I can only shake my head in sorrow. Uh, on the issue of from the river to the sea, uh, these words, of course, do not mean what the supporters of Israel have belatedly uh, decided to call them. Uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What could conceivably be wrong with that? Palestine, in 1947 and 7 eighths, had Jews, Christians, and Muslims living in it, in one country called Palestine, from the river to the sea. Why can't it again have uh, these three great religions present within its borders? There are some people uh, who believe uh, that uh, the children and grandchildren of people who came from Poland or Germany or, or England or France or or, or the United States uh, should go back to those countries. I'm not one of those, as I have said many times. Uh, if you are born uh, in Israel, Palestine, you have a right to remain there, but not in somebody else's house for which you haven't paid, not on somebody else's land, uh, which those who rightly own it have been driven from, and not at the expense of millions of Palestinians displaced inside their own country in the likes of Gaza or turned into refugees outside the borders of Palestine and living a life of utter misery punctuated by carnage uh, ever since. You don't have that right. But as you correctly said, the corollary is actually point number one 
in Netanyahu's party program. Point number one, those very words, from the river to the sea, there will be only Israeli sovereignty. That is point one in the Israeli ruling party's political program. So they're allowed to say there will be no Palestinian state, but Palestinians are not allowed to say that we should have one democratic state where the people of all religions and none can live as equal citizens. What nonsense is this? But I make an overarching point. Some of you won't like it. This bollocks of calling everybody and anything anti-Semitic has completely bankrupted the term. On the principle that if everybody's first class, nobody's first class. If everybody is an anti-Semite, nobody is an anti-Semite. How can we tell the difference? If you're going to call Nelson Mandela an anti-Semite, how can we take seriously anything that you say? Even if it might be true, in many cases, there are anti-Semites. I regularly block them on my Twitter feed. There are people who are consumed by anti-Jewish hate, conspiracy theorists and all. There are such people. They exist. Former friends of mine, I'm sorry to say very much former friends of mine, uh, the Goldsmith brothers, uh, have they, they told me about an anti-Semitic incident in a pub upstairs at a function that they personally were caught up in. So I'm in no doubt that anti-Semites exist. But if you go around calling everyone who is opposed to the political state of Israel as an anti-Semite, you have devalued the term, the charge, to the point of bankruptcy, and that is a danger to all Jews and to everyone else. Trevor is in Cambridgeshire in England on Palestine. Trevor, what would you like to say? Oh, good evening, George. It's a pleasure again to talk to you. Um, uh, just no surprise to anybody, my take on the, the conflict with Israel Hamas is purely money and power. I know we're going to be um, we're going to be thinking, well, what a shock! But what we're going to be hearing in the news going forward is lots of talk about the Red Sea, lots of talk about the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which is the entrance to the Red Sea, which is where Yemen is, and this is why we've got this um, this uh, a lot of talk at the moment about the Yemen uh, uh, terrorists, rather. And obviously, this 19th of November, we had the very professionally filmed hijack of the uh, tank of the ship Galaxy Leader. Now, this is obviously to bring this the, the nasty Yemeni Houthis, um, the, the the nice shipping people being uh, attacked into inside the the Red Sea or into the entrance of the Red Sea, and this is all about bringing a, a naval pre presence, a military naval presence into the Red Sea to dominate trade. Now, researching this as I have been, I've only learned today that there's been a new operation being launched by, I think it's Lloyd Austin, General Lloyd Austin called Operation Prosperity Guardian. <clears throat> now, Prosperity and Guardian, clearly, that is the, the guardian of the prosperity of the shipping lane in the, uh, the, uh, the Babel uh, Maneb Strait into the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal. Now, the Suez Canal is obviously uh, controlled by the Egyptians, and they earn seven billion end of fiscal year 22, and 9.4 billion in the end of year fiscal year 2023. So, if the uh, if the, the the powers that be that have got the biggest biggest military power can take charge of that revenue uh, via the Suez Canal, and they've got a clear straight cut revenue of 10, 10 billion a year. But I think what they're going to do 
is to displace the Palestinians in order to uh, fulfill this plan of the Ben Gurion Canal, which uh, tra tra tracks the the, uh, the east side of the Sinai Peninsula through the Palestinian Gaza Strip to the Mediterranean Sea, thus creating the corridor. So this is part of a massive plan that's been going on for a long, long time. Really and truthfully, right the way back from when the British Empire uh, held Egypt and, to, and, and held control of the Suez Canal, and obviously the Suez Canal has become, yeah, it's, it's, maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's unreliable now, and they're, they're, they're going to use Israel and Gaza and the the, uh, the Ben Gurion Canal in order to um, facilitate transportation on this route, saving, I mean, collecting and earning billions a year. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that, George? Well, uh, again, it's like the answer I gave uh, to the person who was talking about the building of luxury Israeli flats on the uh, beach at Gaza. It ain't going to happen, mate. There's not going to be a Ben-Gurion canal because Gaza is undefeated. They have slaughtered 26,000 people, yes, but they have not defeated the Palestinian resistance. They will not defeat the Palestinian resistance. They will not be able to clear the 2.3 million Palestinians from Gaza. These are all fantasies. These are all castles built in the air, or the fetid air of the Zionist circles in Tel Aviv. But they will not happen. They will not be able to happen. Who's going to sail? The, if you can't sail your ships through the Red Sea, try sailing them through the Gaza Strip, for God's sake. The Palestinians will not disappear. They will not flee. You cannot kill 2.3 million of them. That's impossible. And all the children of all the people that you have already killed are already in the army, just waiting to take their place. Because that's what you do. That's what I'd do. If they killed my mother and father, as soon as I was able to, I would kill them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't anybody? Wouldn't all these families? be determined to revenge of their slain mothers? What kind of people do you imagine that they are? Those who survive this genocidal onslaught, how radical do you imagine they're going to be about Israel and any Ben-Gurion canal being dug through their territory? It's all fantasy economics, as is uh, the Operation Prosperity Guardian, who came up with that name, for God's sake. What good are naval assets in the Red Sea? The Yemenis don't have a navy. They're not firing these weapons from the sea. They're firing them from land. And unless you're going to invade Yemen, in which case you don't need an, a navy, you need an army. Whose army? is going to invade Yemen. That's already been tried and failed. The Yemenis hold all the cards here, and their card is this, an immediate halt to the genocidal attack on the Palestinian people in Gaza, in Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. And until you halt that genocidal assault, we will make sure that no ships to or from Israel will pass through the Red Sea. Who's going to stop that? A German warship? How? A British warship? An American warship? How is that going to stop it? So the objection I have, dear friend, uh, to the points that you very cogently made, is that they are utterly fatalistic. They imagine that the wishes of the enemy are facts, but they're not facts until they're facts. They remain only wishes. And those wishes, I assure you, will be 
unfulfilled. Lyle sends an email, I'm on the verge of homelessness and it deeply saddens me that my tax dollars are being used to kill people instead of helping the struggling people in my country like me. It gives me no hope for the future. Thank you, George, for speaking out on what's happening. Heart-rending, uh, Lyle. Uh, you may have seen uh, the Israeli missiles uh, with the names of lots of Americans, many of them. It read like a guest list of the mother of all talk shows. Missiles on which they'd written the names of the likes of Jackson Hinkle uh, and Scott Ritter. Uh, they, there they are there look they've got their hit list on these missiles this is a threat of death against American citizens on bombs paid for by the American taxpayer people like you are homeless or on the verge of it in the United States whilst hundreds of billions of your tax dollars have been given first to Ukraine and now to Israel let's hear from Michael in West Yorkshire, in England. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, George. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to say about Piers Morgan, I think he's part of a pro-Israel campaign waged by sections of the mainstream media and Tory politicians, which is designed to sort of dilute the Palestine issue with domestic identity politics, thereby kind of mobilizing the anti-immigration, anti-ethnic minority lot as a popular counterweight to the massive support that we've seen for Palestine on the streets of Britain. Yeah. And I think that's why Tories Correct. like Suella Braverman and figures like Douglas Murray are trying to stoke up this kind of anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant sentiment, as we saw with the poppy saga on Amistice Day, trying to other people who support Palestine and create a we against them dichotomy. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about was the British government's support for Israel under the, con the current Conservative government, which is um, we're seeing the government sort of playing a role in silencing domestic pressure against Israel's mass killing of civilians in Gaza and the West Bank, um, and by aiding Israel through diplomatic cover and justifying its right to defend itself, the Br British government's actions are creating a sort of discursive space for the Israeli regime to displace and kill civilians under the guise of a war on Hamas slash terrorists. Um, so I think really underpinning the government's support for Israel is its prescription of Hamas as a terror organization. Since opposing Israel and supporting Palestinian resistance and calling for a ceasefire are often tarnished as supporting terrorism, Israel is then regarded as having the moral high ground and given legitimacy, while Palestinian resistance is delegitimized in the process. Um, and meanwhile, what we can see is that the Palestinian resistance has no interest in attacking people outside of Palestine, whilst the Israelis have been responsible for extrajudicial assassinations, left, right and centre, um, intrigue on foreign soil and so on and so forth. So my question to you is, do you agree with me that the prescription of Palestinian resistance as terror and uh, as terrorists and, you know, uh, terror organizations should be challenged because it's prejudicing the discourse on this situation that we're seeing and also, you know, um, it's kind of preventing people who want peace and want an end to illegal occupation from waging successful com campaigns against Israel when they're always being t tarnished as supporting terrorists. Well, it isn't working. Uh, sing hallelujah. Uh, from his uh, window uh, in St. Peter's Square this evening, uh, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, 800 million strong, said that the terrorists were Israel. The Israeli terrorists who murdered two of his flock this day in the Holy Family Church in Gaza, inside the church, and then dropped white phosphorus on the congregation to try to clear them out of the church a church previously bombarded. So Pope Francis is not a Muslim. Pope Francis is not in any way an, a delegitimized uh, source of discourse, of, uh, of narrative creation. He's the Pope, for God's sake. 
it's not working here. Millions of people are listening to me. And twice a week I'm broadcasting. And they will never other me. I had steak and kidney pie for my dinner, although I'm thousands of miles away from Britain. Then I watched the Premier League on television. I'm speaking to you in the Queen's English. Quite well, I hope. Nobody could be more British than me. I'm the leader of a British political party, a very fastly growing one, the Workers' Party of Britain. They will never other me. And you shouldn't let them other you. You need to if you're going to be in this struggle, and I have been for more than 50 years. You need to know everything that they know and more. I always used to say that when this show began on Talk Sport Radio almost 20 years ago now. I always used to say before they started talking, be sure that there is nothing that you know that I don't know. So don't try and bamboozle anybody with falsifications of history, of religion, uh, and so on. You need to arm yourself with the words, with the knowledge. You need to arm yourself above all with the courage. Courage. Be brave. Don't be afraid. You're on the right side. You're on the side of the righteous. God is watching everyone and everything. And watches not just what we do, but what we did not do when we could have done it. It's been marvelous. I hope you'll agree. The 300th edition of this iteration of the mother of all talk shows. Moats on TV. For many years, we were on different radio stations. Talk Sport, Talk Radio, WBAI in Wall Street, New York. We've been around the houses, but in this, by far the most successful iteration. Millions of people are watching the mother of all talk shows, and I thank each and every one of you for being a part of that audience. God willing, I'll be back on Wednesday at the slightly later time of 9 p.m. UK time. Why not join me then? And why not bring another person with you? Good night.